All right. So that is now officially recording, so we can start our class. Okay. So, James put this cord right in my way. Move that up here. Uh, we're going to start out with preliminaries. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of just basic math. I'm not sure if you've had it before. I'm not sure if you haven't. But I'm going to go through it. If you have questions, how can I stress this point out? I have three students in this class. I am here to teach you all calculus. There is no reason that every single one of you can't understand every single thing that we cover in this class. If something is not making sense, if you're not understanding something, stop me. There's no rule that says we have to cover this much material before the year is over. And I'd rather you understand this much material than have covered this much material. So make sure you understand. Don't let me go forward if you don't understand. Today we're going over preliminaries, meaning this is material that you've most likely already come across in other math classes. And you're most likely familiar with it. If you're not, stop me. Let's go into it in more depth. We can go into as much depth as we need to to make everything make sense. And then Mark, I asked to be here for two reasons. One, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. I'm going to try to rigorously go through this material. The more rigorously you try to prove your math, the more prone you are to error. So Mark's here to help me catch those mistakes. But you are here to help me catch those mistakes. It is absurd that if all of you are keeping up with me, that a mistake never stays on this whiteboard. That just shouldn't happen. Right? We got five brains making sense of everything I write here. If nonsense gets up here, one of those brains should be able to catch it. So catch me, point out mistakes, feel comfortable saying, oh, that's not right, if you think it's not right. Even if you're wrong and you say, I think that's not right, that's still a great sign of my book. Means you're trying, means you're paying attention, means you're actually thinking about what I'm putting on that board. So that's wonderful. Feel free to do that at any time, okay? I am going to make mistakes. Watch my geometry lectures, I found out, I say the wrong word left and right. <laughs> and no one hardly ever calls me on it. Call me on it. Make sure what I'm saying makes sense. I'll just use this for my notes. This is back. Because James thinks he can just monopolize the space with his cord. All right. So the first topic that we're going to cover today is sets. How many of you are familiar with sets? Someone? All right. So as a general rule, when we write a set, we use parentheses like this. And then you put some odd brackets, and then you put objects inside the set. This is a perfectly valid set. There's a set. Write another set for you. What's the difference between those sets? Nothing. Nothing. So that's the first point. Those sets are the same. So the definition I give for a set, even though it's an undefined term, this just gives you the intuition, it is an unordered, unique collection. What do I mean by unordered? I mean order doesn't matter. Oops, I didn't change it. Oh, yeah, good. Unordered meaning order doesn't matter. Unique meaning duplicates don't matter. So if you have a repeating objects inside of a set, it's redundant. And then trying to check the order of a set is redundant. These two sets are equivalent sets. Okay? How many objects are in this set, though? Four. Four. No! There are three objects in this set. I have one, square, and star. There's three objects in there. The same any that are in there, because they're the same set. You know what the same means? It means there's no difference between those. And how can you say there's four objects in there? Three. Ah, three, not four. Wonderful. So there's three objects in there, right? Yes. Okay. So that's some intuition for what a set is. Let's try one more. How many objects are in this set? Four. Two. That's a three, by the way. Oh, cool. Not another prince. Not a bracket. <laughs> bracket, bracket, one, two, three, bracket, bracket. <laughs> How many objects are in this set? Three. What? What's inside this set? The set containing one, two, three. That's what's inside the set. Let me put another object in this 
Now I have two objects here. Right? Let me put another object in there. Those are all brackets. And then here's the ending one for the second. Six. No. No! Three. three objects in there. There's a set containing one, two, three. There's star. And then there's a set containing the set containing the set containing the empty set. Okay? Three objects in this set. Good? Yeah. So that's the um, intuition about what a set is. And then there's a lot of notation that I'm just going to use, so you just have to get comfortable with it. This notation, that symbol right there. How do I read this? The element that is in this set. So star is a member of this set. Square is not a member of this set. Square is a member of this set, and square is a member of this set. So that's how you read that symbol. That means that is a member of this set. That is not a member of this set. You with me? Let me show a little more things, make sure that you get it. Three again. I'm gonna do that a lot. Is this statement true or false? True. True. I may ask you one more time before I yell. Is this statement true or false? True. It's true. It's Correct. <laughs> All right. So we got that. Is a member of? Is not a member of? Uh, maybe I'll, no, we're fine. Okay, some common sets that are going to come up again and again. So let's make sure that we understand what they all are. First off, there's this symbol. This symbol is shorthand for the empty set. It is our shorthand for this. A set containing no objects, an empty set. A set containing no objects, an empty set. Shorthand for it. Good so far? Okay. Another common notation. An N with an extra line. This is our set for the natural numbers. In the context of this class, the natural numbers are the numbers 1, 2, 3, basically all the positive whole numbers. You feel like you understand what that represents? Yeah. Yeah. Question Is 1276 a member of this set? Yeah. Yeah. What about 1277? What about 1,288.0? No. Yes! Oh, same same number. number. <laughs> All right. Do you know what's in there? Maybe we should have started by talking about numbers. Let's cover some stuff real quick. 2 over 2 is the number, although we haven't defined this notation yet. But for the sake of... Those are all perfectly valid ways to write the exact same number. That's one. Right? Okay. Now we'll define these symbols as we use them, but you already have intuition for what those symbols mean. Uh, so that's what the natural, that's the naturals. Then we have the integers. We use a Z with an extra line. Integers are negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. And dot 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 over there, and dot 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 over there. All whole numbers. That's what integers are. Good? Mm -hmm. Alright. Then we have the rationals. That's Q with an extra line to side. This one's harder to just write out. So let me introduce. Well, first I'll give a TM word. How, how did I do it here? Did I introduce set builder notation? Is it in every real number? No. Oh, yeah. The so rationals, in short, are every possible fraction. One half is a rational. Three fifths is a rational. So if it's an integer over an integer, it's a rational. So maybe I'll introduce you to set builder notation, and then we'll come back and write this out explicitly. 
set builder notation you're probably already familiar with. The way you typically see it is it's the set. Uh, what set should we create? Should we do the set of even numbers real quick? Yeah. Right, the set of even numbers real quick using set builder notation. Two, four, three. Yeah, but now we're going to use set builder notation. Two, three. So it's the set of all x. We use some dummy variable. And then we state what property that dummy variable satisfies. And then you put a line here of colon, both logically equivalent. Some use colon, some use line. I think this author chooses to use a vertical line. So we're creating the evens. The evens are the set of all x such that, what do we know about evens? We know that they're integers. And we know that 2 divides them. They're divisible by 2. Maybe you haven't seen that symbol before. That just means 2 goes into it evenly. Okay. And it doesn't mean like divide. Yeah, it doesn't mean divide. So here's explicitly how we can write out all the even numbers. It's the set of all x where x is an integer and x is divisible by 2. That's the evens. Okay? So the rationals are the set of all, should I do it the long way or the short way? We'll do it the long way. The set of all x such that x is equal to m over n, n is not equal to 0, and m and n, dude, that's hard to say with a comma, m and n are both integers. Okay? That's a set of rations. It's a set of all x where x can be expressed as a fraction of two integers where the denominator isn't zero. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so Is three fifths in here? Integers yeah. are, can be. They're the integers. Yeah. Talking about these ones. Talking about take one of those and put it over another one of those, but not zero. So question, 5 thirds, is that irrational? Yes. Yeah. Negative 5 thirds. Yeah. What about 0 divided by 97? Yeah. Yes. Yes. What's 0 divided by 97? Zero. 0. 0, which sure the heck is right there. Oh, 0 over 97. That's a good one. Is every integer irrational? Mm, no. What integer is not irrational? 0 over 0. What integer? Pick an integer. Yeah. Is not irrational. Oh no, every single one. Every, single one. every integer is irrational. Yeah. Wonderful. So you'll notice we have natural numbers up here, and you'll notice every natural number is an integer, and every integer is irrational. Okay. And then finally, we have the set of the real numbers, which we can't just write out nicely like this. But you've worked with the real numbers. It's most likely what you think in your head when I say is something a number. Maybe you've come across complex numbers before. So if you know what complex numbers are, think about every number that's not a complex number. That's a real number. Square root of 2, is that a real number? No. It's complex. Wait, complex involves imaginary. Complex involves imaginary. Right. Does it have an imaginary part? No. So if you come across complex numbers and you understand what that means, great. If you have come across complex numbers and you don't know what an imaginary number that's fine. You don't need it for the purposes of this class yet. So the real numbers, square root of 2 is a real number. What about pi? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is pi a rational number? No. You can't express pi as a fraction of 2 yeah, integers. Yeah, yeah. 21 over 7. It's close. That's a close approximation. Uh, it's but 21 over 7 is just 3, so. 21 over, it's. But there is a fraction seven. that is real close. But that's just a numeric approximation. You can't express pi this way. What about the square root of 2? Square root of 2 is not rational. We'll prove that. It's not. Is the square root of 3? Is the square root of 4? Yes. Is the square root of 5? No. Is the square root of 6? Yes. No. <laughs> oh, Turns good. out it's an interesting property, but the square root of any whole number that doesn't come out to a whole number is actually not rational. Very interesting property. True. True. I keep proving that. 
No, it's your life. I think about it. All right, let's do some more set building notation. Uh, let's define the natural numbers using set builder notation. Another way I could have written the natural numbers is it's set of all x such that x is an integer and what? And x is greater than 0 or greater than or equal to 1. Both of those will give us the natural numbers. Okay? Uh, let's try reverse. I'll give you a set. Try and come up with a way of writing it this way. So I give you the set, let's see, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, dot, dot, dot. You yeah. see what those are? Yeah, they're squares. They're perfect squares, right? 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared. Okay, okay. let's write this with set builder notation. That's the set of all x such that. X such that uh, any x, well, x to the square root of 2. X, <laughs> x to the square root of 2. No, 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 no. <laughs> but x is such that uh, any number. x is such that x is in the integers where x squared. No, not in oh. Because I haven't put any restriction on what you can pick for x. No, I'm not real. Not real. Integer. Rational. And rational turns out, but that's not obvious. Uh, right. But this one is obvious. Uh, can you do that with? Obvious. Can you do that? Rational is obvious. It's not. Because it's not obvious. Yeah. Right. That's why I said. Oh, in fact, it's just not true. Yeah, the square root is zero. Nine halves is the square root of 81 fourths. So I will put 81 fourths in here. But 81 fourths isn't one that we have here. So that has to be natural numbers or integers. But either way, this is a valid way of writing the check, right? Yeah, can you put integers in there so it can't be zero? <laughs> you can't do negative. Yeah, I, have to, I could put integers in there, but then I have to make one more statement. Where right, that right, square right, root right, comes right. out in the integers and x is not equal to zero. So I could write it that way. Because we don't want the zero up here, right? No, you can't take the square root of a negative number or else you can't take the square root of negative only. Can you, you take, take the square, square root, root of, of a negative number, number. Or you just get a complex number. Big one. Yeah, so I say you can't take the square root of two, you get an irrational number. Yeah, but it doesn't come out to a, a rational number. Right. We're saying it's a set of all x such that their square root is an integer. Don't use zero. Oh, right. Right? Uh, this square root function, maybe you should clarify, is always a positive number. This is a function. Square root of x. So, you can have so when you're solving an equation like x squared equals 9, then the next step is typically x equals plus or minus the square root of 3. The reason we put that plus or minus there is because that. by definition, square root thank you. This plus or minus the square root of nine because by definition, square root function always gives you a positive number. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We always take the positive number. The square root of nine is three. It's not plus or minus three, it's just three. So x to satisfy this equation is plus or minus the square root of nine, which is three. Does that make sense? Anyways, so there's another one. Uh, here's another way that we could have written that. One that you probably are more comfortable with. So I said y, or it's a set of all y, where y is equal to x squared, and x is a natural number. We could have introduced another number variable. Mm -hmm. Right? Another perfectly valid way to write out the set. So that's set builder notation. Any questions with that? Is y the number inside sets in this? You can use the result. any variable you want. 
It's just a variable. It is a matter of convention that we use y to signify coordinates. Sorry, coordinates. Coordinates. No, I said it right. But you guys dropped out my geometry. What's the x axis? Axis. Abscissas. Abscissas and coordinates, but they don't know what those are. By convention, we use an x's and y's the way that you've seen us use x's and y's. We call one thing the x coordinate axis and one thing the y coordinate axis, and we use y to talk about the result of a function and x to talk about what goes into a function. But none of these are functions, these are just sets. We haven't talked about functions yet, we'll get to those. Okay. So that's set field notation. Any questions so far? We're going to fill out the real numbers. Uh, maybe now's the time we're having this part of the competition. There's two ways to begin our class. One of the ways that people like to begin it is they start out with the natural numbers, they assume you know the natural numbers, and they assume that you know plus and multiplication with the natural numbers. And then they use those to construct the integers with plus and multiplication. And then they use those to construct the rationals, and then you can have plus and multiplication. Oh, Sorry. Start with plus and multiplication on the natural numbers here. Notice you can add any of those numbers together and you can multiply any of those numbers together. And you get those numbers again, right? Yeah. So some classes start with that. Then they use those to construct the integers and all the operations that you have on the integers. So the operations that you have on the integers are plus, multiply, but now you have the notion of subtraction. Right. Which is adding a negative. Two minus three is the same thing as two plus negative three. And we'll actually define it when we come to the top. But then they use the integers to construct the rationals. And then they use the rationals to construct the riddles. That's one way to go about this class. The other way to go about the class is to say the real numbers are the set which satisfies these axioms, these properties. Any set that satisfies these properties, we call this set the real numbers. And then we define the rationals as a subset of the real numbers, the integers as a subset of the real numbers, and the natural numbers as a subset of the real numbers. Okay. We're going to be taking that second approach. So you don't know what these are, these are yet, and that we're going to say exactly what these are. These are the set that satisfies, and we're going to go over all the properties that it satisfies. The axioms are the real numbers. Any set that satisfies these properties, that's the real numbers. So we're going to go over that. But that's the way we're going to do it. And then we're going to view this as a subset of the real numbers, this is a subset of the real numbers, this is a subset of the real numbers. You know what I mean by subset? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's inside. Notice we said everything in here is also in here, or everything in here is in here, and everything in here is in here, and everything in here is in here. Mm -hmm. That means this is a subset of this, this is a subset of this, and this is a subset of this. Or can we view that? So we'll get to what exactly the real numbers are. Uh, more notation. that I'm just going to use throughout the class because it's just common mathematics notation and I'm sorry if you haven't seen it before you're just going to have to learn to get comfortable with it and it's this symbol the next one we're going to talk about that symbol can be interpreted as for all or for each or for every those are common ways that we read that symbol. So let me see it in action. Let me show you it in action real quick. So if I were to say for all x in n, so for all natural numbers, x is greater than or equal to 1. There's a true statement. Good? Yeah. Here's a false statement. For all x in n, x is less than 2. There is an x in n. There is a natural number that's less than 2, right? 1. But it's not true for all of them. Or for every. Or for each of them. You see how we read this? Yeah. And then the other one that we need to go over is that big backwards e, and that's shorthand for there exists. So, true or false? True. 
True. There exists a natural number. There exists some element in N. There exists a natural number such that that number is less than 2. Namely, 1. That's a true statement. Is this a true statement? 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 Yeah. Yeah. For all natural numbers, it's greater than or equal to 1. Okay? Uh, one more shorthand that doesn't need a lot of explanation. You'll see me do this a lot. S dot T dot just means such that. It's such a common phrasing that we use that shorthand. And I'll say it out loud as I'm writing these things. Every time I use the symbols, I'm not just going to be quiet at their writing. So you'll be reminded over and over again what they mean, but wanted to show you straight out. Uh, how are we doing for time? Whew, so much to cover still. Next. Uh, so good with this notation? Yeah. All right. Now we're going to move to logic. You remember doing truth tables? You've ever done truth tables before? Not that you recall? No. All right, so let's go over basic logic. So in logic, uh, there's three very common words that we use over and over again. Those words are and, or, and implies. We use those three words over and over again, and we have symbols for each of them. This is a symbol for and. This is a symbol for or. And this is a symbol for implies. Okay? Uh, when, we, when we take two statements and we use and in between them, I didn't put this into my notes until the very last second, so let's go over and real quick. Let's just see the next. So and combines two statements. Maybe we should start with statements. Maybe we should start with just discussion and logic in general. You say that we have class this Friday? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make this Friday's class logic. I'm going to have to prepare for that thoroughly. If you haven't seen these words before, you don't remember three tables. So, that's what we'll do on Friday. We'll go over in depth logic. Because I need to prepare for that. I can't just do this on the fly and do a good job. Friday. I need to remember that. Okay. So we'll do logic next week, and then we'll continue from there. Uh, but now you don't know if no one gets it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we just got to, we'll do it rough. Okay, so if we're going to talk about logic, we got to start by talking about a statement. All of mathematics is talking about statements. What's the definition of a statement? A statement is something that can either be true or false. Okay? That's what a statement is. Jacob will go to the park today. Is that a statement? Yes, it's either true or false. Will Jacob go to the park today? Is that a statement? No. No, that's a question. True or false, but not false. 17. Is that a statement? No. no. So a statement is something that is either true or false. Oh, another important part of logic is it's not. So we'll just start there. So the first place to start with in logic is the law of contradiction. We say that if a statement is not true, then the statement is false. false. And we say if the statement is not false, then a statement is true. true. That's the law of contradiction. We just assume that's the case. So first we have the not symbol. That's the not symbol in logic. This is not. And then let's see it in a truth table. So I have some statement x, okay? My statement x can either be true or it can be false. We're handling all possible cases for some statement x. Actually, I'll use, sometimes it's more common that you use a capital letter for statement a. I have some statement a. Statement a can either be true or false, right? Mm -hmm. That's all the value statement a can take. And then over here, we're going to write not a. 
So if statement A is true, then not A is false. And if statement A is false, then not A is true. true. This is called the truth table. So that's not. Let's go over in. When you say that one statement is true and another statement is true, what are you saying? So let's quick review. Donnie is holding a marker. True or false? True. True. Donnie is holding an eraser. True or false? False. False. Donnie is holding a marker and Donnie is holding an eraser. False. False. So when we say and, when we say statement one is true and statement two is true, we're saying both statements are true, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see the and in action. So first off, if we're going to and statements together, and doesn't make sense with just one statement, right? Mm -hmm. If I say Donnie is holding a marker and, right, you want something to fill the blank. And combines two statements together. So if we have two statements, here's statement A, here's statement B, let's write out all the possible combinations. We can have statement A true and statement B true. We can have statement A true and statement B false. We can have statement A false, statement B true, and then we can have false false. Those are all the possible combinations, right? Mm -hmm. So if I say statement A is Donnie's holding a marker and statement B is Donnie's holding an eraser, this is setting up the top case. Now I set up this case. Now I set up this case. Now I set up this case. Those are the four possible cases with those statements. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now let's do our truth table. Let's try it out A and B. So for this case, if I'm holding a marker and I'm holding an eraser, am I holding a marker and am I holding an eraser? Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right, what about this case? Got the marker, don't got the eraser. Is the statement Donnie's holding a marker and Donnie's holding an eraser true? No. no. False. Now, what about here? False. false. What about here? False. True. False. If both are false. Donnie's holding a marker and Donnie's holding oh, an eraser. False. It's false. Yeah, it can trick your brain for a second until you just like pick a concrete example and then it just becomes obvious to you. It's like, oh, duh. So it's good to think through it. All right, so that is and. Let's move on to or. Now, or is a little bit more tricky because we use or two different ways in the English language. So when I say uh, Donnie's in classroom two or Donnie's in classroom five, your brain most likely interprets that as Donnie's in classroom two and he's not in classroom five, or Donnie's in classroom five and he's not in classroom two. That's one way that our brains use or. One of the two statements is true, but they're not both true and they're not both false. That's one way that we use or. Another way that we use or is along the lines of Donnie's holding a marker or Donnie's holding an eraser. Is a statement Donnie's holding a marker or Donnie's holding an eraser true? Yeah. Yes. So the other way that we use it is at least one of those two statements is true. Okay? The way that we mean it in this class is the latter. It means one of the two statements is true. Then the whole thing is true. So let's write out a truth table. We have statement A, statement B. Once again, or is talking about two statements. I can't say Donnie's holding a marker or, right? So all our possible combinations are false, false, true, 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 false, false, true. Put those in order, you're not used to seeing them. And then A or B. All right, looking at this case, setting up this case, Donnie's holding a marker or Donnie's holding an eraser? True. True. What about this case? False, right? If I'm not holding anything, one of them has to be true. I say Donnie's holding a marker, Donnie's holding an eraser. Uh, no, he's not. Right? False. False. Let's look at this case. Donnie's holding a marker, get rid of the eraser. Is the statement Donnie's holding a marker or Donnie's holding an eraser true? Yes. Yeah. And then finally, if I'm holding both of them, is it true? Yes. If I'm holding both, Make our conclusions. We all make our conclusions based off of the tone people talk about. 
make our conclusions by the logic of the statement, whether or not it makes sense. All right, and then finally, uh, the implication, which we usually do an error like this. Now, this one is very difficult for students who haven't seen it before to wrap their heads around. One of my degrees is math, and I went to school with people who, into their third and last year of college, were still struggling with this idea from time to time. So this is implies. Oh, I'm right there. And it's probably the most important of the symbols, if one is possibly more important than the other. And implies is, once again, one that is a reference to two statements. You need statement A and statement B. Let's set up all our cases. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. The way implication statements are usually phrased is if A, then B. Sorry, let me write it out how we would write it. A, A implies B. Another way that we can read that is if A is true, then B is true. Okay? So let's go over each of these cases. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. True. true. Is that true? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. That one's true. Let's set up the next case. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. False. 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 Good. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. So true. Okay, now here's where this is so helpful. Let me ask you a question. Is a statement false? No. If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Let me say it in a different way. Every time I'm holding a marker, I'm holding an eraser. Is a statement false? No. So it's not false. So it's true. If it's not false, then it's true. That is the big leap that you need to make to make the implication make sense. Or at least that's the way it appeals to my intuition. Is the statement false is sometimes what you need to ask instead of is the statement true. So you say, is the statement false? No. But I can't help it's true. <laughs> if the statement isn't false, then it's true. If the statement isn't true, then it's false, right? Because the statement is one of those two values. So that's the way that you make those make sense. Think about the scenario. If I'm holding a marker, then I'm holding an eraser. Is it false? No. No. Then it's true. So that's, that's what they keep struggling with over and over again. And I promise you that if you haven't done this before, it's going to catch you again and again. It's one of those things that makes sense when the person explains it to you. Then the next week comes by and you start talking about it again. And you're like, why was that true again? It's going to happen. And then finally, let's set the last case. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. It's true. Is it false? You're not holding it. Is the statement, every time oh, I'm holding lost. a marker, yeah. I'm holding okay. an eraser. Yeah. There you go. It's true, right? It messes with your brain a little bit when it's the first time that you've seen it. Hopefully James is comfortable with this stuff. You're not? <laughs> See? And we spend the whole... He's gone through this twice now. So you'll go through this material, it'll make perfect sense when you go through it, time will go by, you'll see it again, and it will stump you. And that's just almost a guarantee. Alright, apparently ESPN has some news. Okay. Uh, and then we use combinations of these statements in various ways. The last one I want to introduce is really just using so here's what it's logically equivalent to. So it's just using the statements we already have. It's A implies B and B implies A. Now you can write out the logic table for this. In fact, let's just do it. I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit time consuming, but I think in the end it helps you see how you link logic together. And then we'll be done with logic. So let's look at A. Let's look at B. What are all the possible combinations? True, false. true, true, true false. false, false, true, false, false. You write it in a traditional order. Okay. 
Ultimately, the statement that we want to analyze is A implies B and B implies A. When is that statement true? So, maybe, maybe put it up here real quick, what we're doing. So we're defining this symbol, which is the double arrow. And this symbol is the same thing as, sorry, we need letters to make, make sense. A, back and forth arrow, B, is the same thing as A implies B and B implies A. So do you understand what we're doing? I may define, I may say when this is true, but the definition of this is this over here. So we need to find out when this statement's true. And I'm going to break it up into its pieces. I'm going to break it up into this piece. I'm going to break it up into this piece. Or, sorry. I'm going to break it up into this piece and this piece, and then finally all of them together. So here we're going to do A implies B. When is that true? Here we're going to figure out when B implies A is true. And then here we're finally going to put it all together. We're going to figure out when A implies B and B implies A. So let's start with this one. Does true imply true? Yes. 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 Does true imply false? No. 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 Does false imply true? Yes. No. Yeah. No, false. That's true. If you have no marker, that doesn't mean you have to be erased. If Donnie's holding a marker, then he's holding an eraser. Then he's holding an eraser. There's oh. a statement of false. No. No. No, so it's true. Uh, let me help your intuition one more time. When implications start with false, they're always true. False implies true and false implies false. So these are both true. But let me help your intuition one more time uh, with the idea of a vacuously true statement. Statements are never true. So if I start a statement with, if Donnie is a purple elephant, then you can put any statement you want there and the whole implication is true. Because Donnie is never a purple elephant. We can never call this statement false. And if it's not false, then it's true. So I can say if Donnie's a purple elephant, then the sun is made out of water. That statement is true. It's called vacuously true because there's no cases that you can check. What about the case right now? If Donnie's a purple elephant, oh, yeah. then the sun is made out of water. Is Donnie a purple elephant? No. No, so you can't check. So you can't call the statement false. So, you so the statement's check. not false. So how can you not check that you're holding the marker? Well, you can in that case, but... Not holding the so it's not a matter of, is it possible to do it? It's a matter of, is it true? Am I a purple elephant? No. Is it possible that maybe someday there's a technology to turn Donnie into a purple elephant, and then we can check the statement? Yeah. Yeah, but we're evaluating the statement right now. If Donnie's a purple elephant, then the sun is made out of water. Is Donnie a purple elephant? No. no, then we can't call the statement false. Is Donnie holding a marker? No. Then we can't call the statement false. <laughs> if Donnie's holding a marker, then we're only asserting something if I'm holding a marker. If I'm yeah. not holding a marker, then we can't call what I'm asserting false. Okay. If it's not false, it's true. It's going to catch you over and over. And that's okay. That's the way this company goes over for the first time. So true implies true, true. True implies false, false. False implies true, true. False implies false, true. Okay? It takes some getting used to. Alright, now let's do B implies A. Does true imply true? Yes. Yes. Does false imply true? Just went over this. False implies true? Yes. 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 Does true imply false? No. 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 Does false imply false? Yes. 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 Okay. So we worked out that part of the statement. We worked out that part of the statement. Now let's combine it. We're saying this and this. That's the same thing as this and this, right? Yeah. So we're anding these two columns together. True and true is? True. True. False and true is? False. False. Remember, and is both of them. True and false is false. And then true and true is true. 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 Okay. So we had to do all that work to create this truth table. Now let me give you the quick intuition for when the statement is true. 
A implies B and B implies A is only true when A and B have the same value. Here they have the same value, true. Here they have the same value, true. Okay. Um, using English, we would say if A, then B, and if B, then A. That's how you would read that, right? Yeah. The way that we read this is A, if and only if B. Okay? And another way that we talk about this arrow is we say the two are logically equivalent. If you have A, if and only if B, then that's the same thing as the two are logically equivalent. If this is true, then both of them are logically equivalent. If this is true, then both of them are logically equivalent. If this is false, then they're not logically equivalent. If this is false, then they're not logically equivalent. Okay? So another way that you can think about this symbol is we can use it for assigning definitions. Right? Yeah. A number is even if and only if it's divisible by 2. If it's divisible by 2, it's even. If it's even, it's divisible by 2. That's our definition of even. So that, that terminology, even, implies divisible by 2. That's our definition for it. So you thought you'd be comfortable with this? Logically equivalent. Okay, so that's our crash course on logic. Uh, shorthand, once again. So instead of saying if A, then B, and if B, then A, we have the notation A if with two Fs B. This is shorthand for that statement. This is also the same thing as A if and only if B. That, that, and that are all the same. When I read this statement, I'll typically say A if and only if B. A is true if and only if B is true. Another way to say that. So A is true if B is true, and A is only true when B is true. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's continue over here. So moving on now to set equality. How do we show that two sets are the same? So if I have to set one, two, square, three, star, 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 and I have to set square, two, one, star, three, three, are those sets the same? Yes. You sure? Sure. So how do you know that those two sets are the same or those two sets are equal? Yeah, so one way to say it is we'll call this set A and we'll call this set B. We say every object in set A is in set B and every object in set B is in set A. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's how we check that. So let's write out set equality exactly. So. Set A is equal to set B if and only if for each object in set A, that object is in set B, and for each object in set B, then 
Maybe instead of that, we'll do this. Then that, comma, and for each object in set B, then that object is in set A. So let's read through that, make sure we understand it. So I can write set A is equal to set B. So here's the names of our two sets. So those two sets are equal if and only if, this is the only way for it to be true, it's a definition, if for each object in set A, then that object is also in set B, and for each object in set B, then that object is also in set A. We use and, which means both these have to be true. Right? Yeah. Think that makes sense? Yeah. That's how we check if two sets are equal. Um, when we're talking about the objects in a set, we typically call them members or elements. The members of this set are square, two, one, star, and three. The elements of this set are one, two, square, star, and three. Okay? Just terminology. So that's why when I read this, I'll often say something like, for each element in A, or for each member of A, is how I would read that statement right there. Okay. Um, set equality, and then subsets. Maybe write down those exact examples. Subset. So our subset notation is this with the bar over it. You've probably seen this before. A is a subset of B. It's like a side U. You've seen this notation or this notation before? Not that you remember. So I don't need to bother clarifying the difference and we'll just talk about this as a subset. Yeah. Alright. So since you don't know already now, then we'll just talk about it as if you don't know. So A is a subset of B is the way that we read this. And what does it mean? It means every element of A is a subset of B. Or every every element of A is also an element of B. Or every member of A is a member of B. Does that make sense? Yeah. It doesn't mean every member of B is a member of A. So when we were talking about the sets I erased, we said that the natural numbers are a subset of the integers. The integers are a subset of the rationals. The rationals are a subset of the reals. Okay, so those are some examples real quick. So, let's write it out exactly. So, A is a subset of B. Well, don't use a symbol in our definition of it. A is a subset of B if and only if for all X in A, then X is also in B. So this is an implication. We're saying that if, let me write out logic notation, statement, if X is in A, maybe just write it this way, X is in A implies X is in B for all X. If for all X, X is in A implies X is in B, then A is a subset of B. Good? Yeah. All right. And then let's write up some statements here, and you'll tell me whether or not they're true or false. True or false? True. True? Subset means smaller. Well, no, the statement's not true. So. The statement. No, this is what subset means. There's nothing. This doesn't use the word smaller once. So you're right. This is true. I'll try another one. Is A a subset of A? Yes. Yeah. For any set, it's always a subset of itself. Pick a set. It's a subset of itself. 
You instantly know the subset of a set no matter what. All right, let's do this one.
same way you apply it to two sets, the same way you apply it plus to two numbers. Okay? And the union of two sets is, it gives you the set, we'll just write it right out. That gives you the set of all x such that, or where, x is in A or x is in B. Okay? So let's do an example and see this in action real quick. So if I say the set 1, 2, 3, union with the set 3, 4, 5, my resulting set is the set of everything is the set of all x where x is in A or x is in B. So I'll start with, is 1 in here? Yeah. Yeah, because 1 is in A or it's in B. Is 2 in here? Yeah. Is 3? Yeah. Is 4? Yeah. Is 5? Yeah. Is 6? No. no. Alright. Okay? There's an example. Let's do another example. What is A union with the empty set? Just A. Just A, whatever A is. For any set. If A was this, then it's 1, 2, 3. But A in general, any set in general, union it with the empty set, gives you that set. You can kind of think about this as similar to adding 0. Set union empty set is very similar to number plus 0. Gives you back the number. Set union empty set gives you back the set. Okay. So you feel like you got some good intuition for what union is? Mm -hmm. Let's go over intersection. A intersection, B. The definition of this is it's a set of all x such that x is in A and x is in B. Okay? So let's do these two again. So is this kind of like this? So what's the intersection of these two? It's just going to be 3. Perfect. What's the intersection of these two? Just Oh, wait. No, it's Take be everything that's in here and in here. What do you get? The, the empty set. The empty set. So A intersect the empty that set. That is a lot like Is zero. equal to the empty set. Yeah. That looks a lot like a number times 0 is 0. A number plus 0 is A. Right? And you can actually get down to set definitions of what we mean when we say plus and what we mean when we say multiply. Everything in mathematics is defined in terms of sets. Every object that you deal with in mathematics is a set. For example, the definition, we, if we were to build the natural numbers, the definition of zero is the empty set. The definition of one is the set containing zero, which is the set containing the empty set. The definition of 2 is the set containing 1 and 0, which is the set containing the set, da, 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 comma, da, da, and, 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 etc. And you can build up our definition of the natural numbers. Everything comes back to set theory in mathematics. So it's the foundation of all math. I don't care if you're talking about algebra, I don't care if you're talking about whatever you're talking about. It comes back to sets. We build up everything from basic set theory. So that's why this is stuff that, you, no matter what field of math, even though you might not remember going over this stuff, I know you did. Because it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. Anyways, that's a little bit of tangent. So, union and intersection. There's my notes. Uh, and then the last one is the complement. And this book writes the complement different than the way I've seen it. The, the way we read that is the complement of A in B. I think I'm getting too close to this edge. You can see it on the camera. B complement A is, the way we read that is the complement of a in B. This will make more sense when we see it in context, but right now let's just understand the set. It's a set of everything in B that's not in A. So you can almost think about this as B take away A. 
It's a set of everything in B that's not in A. Let me do a Venn diagram real quick to help with intuition. Here's our set B. Here's our set A. The complement, then, of A and B is all this stuff. Everything in B that's not in A. Does that make sense? Yeah. In, in context when we use this, it will be understood that A is a subset of B. Okay? And sometimes we won't bother specifying what the B is. So, for example, later on in this class, I might ask you the question, what's the complement of this interval? One, are you comfortable with intervals? Mm -hmm. So this is all the numbers between one and three, not including one and three, right? Yeah. yeah. This is like a number line. I did not know. Okay, so let's draw the number line. Zero, one, zero, three. When I write this, we're talking about all the points right after one, starting here, and going two, three, not including three. If I wanted to include one, I'd use that. And now that's including one. Good? So, we'll go over interval notation. That's later in my notes. Forgot about that. But just to help you understand the complement. So later on in the class, I might say, so what's the complement of this interval? And it's understood that the B I'm talking about is all real numbers. So the complement of this would be all the numbers from negative, <laughs> negative infinity to Here's one. 1, including 1, and then for union, all the numbers from three to infinity. Okay. And supplement, that's where I remember doing that. Oh, that's, you're thinking about an angle. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about where I've seen complement. Yeah, you could have heard complement in the context of geometry when you're talking about angles. Not the same thing as all here. This is a set operation. Okay, we'll get into that more as those come up. But there's an idea. So that is complement. How do I keep doing my note though? You think I just subconsciously set them in the same place every time, right? So let me write out one more time an example of complements, just so we understand it. Okay, 
So then we're ready to introduce the idea of a relation. Do you remember what a relation is? It's a set of ordered pairs. A relation is a set of ordered pairs. Here's an example of a relation. Here's another example of a relation. It's a set where every member of the set is an ordered pair. That's a relation. It's a special kind of set. Okay. Good? Yeah. All right. Now we're finally ready to talk about a function. Anyone know what a function is? They deal with ordered pairs. We do deal with ordered pairs. Now, um, maybe specify, in the context of this class, every time I say function, I mean a single variable function. It only has one input. In other words, it only gives one output. A function is a... Uh, a function is a relation. So a relation is a special type of set. It's a set where everything in there is an ordered pair. A function, for the purposes of this class, is a relation, but with a special property. Do you remember what that property is? Maybe go back to like graphs, that will help you. If I were graphing some function, is that a function? Yes. You were told yes, that's a function. What if I graph something that looked like that? Is that a function? Nope. No. Two Why X not? Two X dies. Or two Y dies. So where only for every input there's only one output. For every input there's a unique output is one of the ways that we make intuitive sense of what a function is. So now I'm gonna write out exactly what a function is, and it captures that exact same intuition. Well, function. This marker is quitting on me a little bit, isn't it? Just gotta put my bad markers over here. Can I put one on your desk? No. Um, function. All right, what is a function? A function, well, here's how I'll say it. That's not much better. A relation. One of these things, a set of ordered pairs. A relation, we'll designate it with this fancy f. A relation f, that's just a variable designates a relation, is called a function. Provided. Let's try some examples to make sense of definition while we go through this lab. So we'll say f equals e set. And we'll say v equals e set. definition, so let's take it slowly and then we'll reanalyze as we go. So a relation or a set of ordered pairs, we'll use f to represent it, 
uh, relation f is called a function provided if you have an element a, b in there, and you have an element that same a, but it goes to something else, then those two something else is better be the same thing. Another way of saying that is, if a and b are the same number here, then f of a and f of b are the same number here. Right. Maybe I need to capture this notation for a second. Uh, let, let, let's capture this notation for a second and then come back to define function. If I say f is this relation, then f of 1 means the thing that 1 is paired with. That's 2. So what's f of 3 here? Three. Three. f of 3 is 3. All right, same with over here. What's g of 4 over here? All right, what's g of 1? See how it doesn't make sense? Yeah. See how it just broke down? So a function is defined how we don't have this breakdown. In other words, if you have the same element here, you better have the same element here. Notice if we switch that 3 to 2, we now have a function. Why? Because we have 1, 2, and then we have 1, 2 again. Repeating elements don't matter inside a set, so that's the same as just 1, 2, and 4, 7. Okay? So the definition of a function is designed so that this type of thing doesn't break down. We don't want this to break down this notation here. So let's go over the definition again to make sure it makes sense. So a relation or a set of ordered pairs, f, is called a function provided if you have the same element on the left hand side in two different places, like we did here, then whatever they're paired with better be the same thing. Whatever they're paired with better be the same thing. So in this case, a is 1, b is 2, c is 3. Not a function. If we would have switched this 3 with the 2, then now they're the same thing. We're good. That's one way you can think about a function. Another way you can think about it is this way. If two of your left-hand elements are the same, then the thing that they're mapped with better be the same. So if I have a 1 right here, and I map something, it better always come out the same. If I can get this and get this, we're in trouble. Right? Okay, that's a kind of a lot to take in. But that's what a function is. A function is a set of ordered pairs, such that if your inputs are the same, your output better be the same. Or such that each left-hand element is mapped to the exact same right-hand element. Notice that this is still a function. It doesn't matter that 2 is mapped to 3 and 3 is mapped to 3. Right? Just like you would have also called this a function in the context of graphing. Right? This number goes to this output. This number goes to this output. Those are the same. We don't care. It's still a function. So you can have repeating right-hand values. That's fine. But if I have a left-hand value, it better go to one and only one right-hand value. Each left-hand value better go to one and only one right-hand value. One goes to two and one goes to three. No, that doesn't work. Good? So that is what a function is. Now, this isn't how you typically seen functions written out like this, right? You're used to a function that's something along the lines of f of x equals x squared. There's one that you've seen a lot, right? This is shorthand for an infinite function. What is this shorthand for? This is shorthand for the set, and there's infinite elements in the set. I can't write all of them, but I can write some of them. One thing that's in here is 1 and 1. Another thing that's in here is 2 and 4. Another thing that's in here is 1 half, 1 fourth. Da, da, da. There's infinite elements inside this set. This is shorthand to capture this set. What we're saying is the right hand element of any particular x is the square of that value. This tells us how to get the right hand element for a particular left hand element. 
our left hand element is one, our right hand element is one squared. If our left hand element is two, our right hand element is two squared. So this takes us from our left hand element to our right hand element. Right. Our right hand element equals the square of our left hand element. We use x to designate the left hand element, we use f of x to designate the right hand element. Same thing we did over here, right? f of four, what was that? Seven. f of x, what is that? x squared. Square whatever it is. Good? So when you were using this for functions, you were using this infinite set. You just weren't told that that's an infinite set. And then when you graph it, you interpret each one of those things, each member of that set as a point. You plot it. Right? So that is a function. That's notation. Now we need to talk about the domain of a function and the image of a function. The domain of this function is the set of all left-hand values. So the domain of this function, f, and the way that we typically do that is domain of f is the set, what are all its left-hand elements? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Perfect. And then the image of f is all its right-hand elements. Notice that the image and the domain do not have to be the same size. Right? So that's the image and the domain. Is that the right time to introduce that? Let, let's do. No, we'll, we'll do it all together. Okay. So more notation about functions. Maybe you've seen this notation, maybe you haven't. And it's the idea of a function from a particular domain to a particular range is the way you've probably heard it. Or from a particular domain to a particular codomain. It maps all the elements in one set to the elements of another set. And the way that this is first brought up is typically with pictures along the lines of this. So I've got something over here, this is my domain. We'll call it A. And we're going to put some things in there. What do you want in here? Three. Okay. There's our domain. And then let's come up with some codomain. Why is it called a codomain instead of image? The image is something very, is not the same thing as codomain, which is what we're going to go over right now. So codomain right here, I'm going to go uh, 4, 3, 2, 1. All the possible objects. Well, let's just cover it. Alright, so one of the ways that we can picture a function is I pick each element in here, and I map it to something over here. Okay? So if I were to map uh, 1 to 4, uh, 7 to 4, uh, square to 4, and smiley face to 1, then what this image is trying to capture is one comma four, seven comma four, square comma four, Smiley face, comma, one. Okay? So does how I'm using this picture make sense? On how I'm representing a function here? Okay. So if you already know about the set A and the set B, I might want to talk about some arbitrary function f that goes from A to B. In other words, all its left-hand elements come from A, all its right-hand elements are in B. The notation we use for that is f is a function from A to B. That's our notation. What does this mean? It means that the domain of A, or the domain of F is always all of A, and the image of F is a subset of B. What was the image in this case? The set 1, 4. Okay? We always use the entire domain. The domain is by definition, the domain is all the left-hand elements. Okay? 
The definition of the codomain is not all the right-hand elements. That's what the image is. So let me give you an example real quick. If I say f is a function from the real numbers, that's all the numbers, to the real numbers, that's all the numbers, so such that f of x equals x squared. So I'm telling you that everything you can put into this function is a real number, and everything you get out is a real number, okay? You with me so far? But now, what is, first off, what's the domain of this function? What's everything I can plug in? Anytime. All real numbers. But what's the image of the function? No, it's not the set of the real numbers. I'll only get zero and positive numbers here, right? For example, negative three is not a number that I get in the alpha. Oh, yeah. So my right-hand element over here when I was writing out this function is never going to be negative three. Right. Or if you were to graph this function, We use all the x's, but we don't use all the y's, right? We didn't use this part of it. So when you were taking your different classes and you were given a function like this, they were assuming you would interpret it like this. They didn't want to specify every time you see a function, hey, we're talking about a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. Because for all you know, that's not the case. How do I know that this is a function from integers to integers? What if I'm just squaring integers? What if I'm just squaring rational numbers? What if I'm just squaring the number one? What if one's the only thing in the domain? So assume in the context of your different classes that all these functions that you were dealing with were functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. Okay? So they didn't bother specifying this to you, but they told you over and over again, or but they assumed it over and over again, and you use this information over and over again. And then sometimes in class it, they had you determine what the domain of a function could be, right? So they can give you something like f of x equals 1 over x, and you had to determine what the domain of the function could be. Then you'd say, okay, it's all real numbers except for 0, because you can't divide, divide by 0. You might remember doing stuff like that, you might not. But you have been using these ideas before, they just weren't explicitly stated like this. So this right here, I can say that G is a function from A to B where G equals that, right? If we call this mapping I have up here G. Good? Okay. Now you'll notice G only used a subset of B. It could have used all of B, but it only used a subset of B. In other words, the image of G was just 1 and 4. It wasn't 1, 2, 3, 4. If I would have had 1 to 1, 7 to 2, squared to 3, it's minus base to 4, then I would have used the entire codomain. So we have a special name for functions that use the entire codomain. We call them on2. A function is on2 if it uses the entire codomain. When you were taking other classes, you were told that the function y equals x cubed is on 2. And it was in the context of your class when you really think about y as f of x. And when you assume that we're talking about a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, then f of x equals x cubed is on 2. Because I can get any real number from the output, and by definition, the domain is all real numbers. So that f of all real numbers, two real numbers, is the codomain. This is specifying the domain. This is specifying the codomain. Here's my domain A. Here's my codomain B. G is a function whose domain is A and whose codomain is B. Or G is a function whose domain is A and whose image is a subset of A. Right. Those are two ways that you can read that. And if its image is the entire codomain, then it's called on2. So this is on2 in this context. We get every real number. This function is not on2 in the same context.
Right, it's image, it's not the entire code domain. I can't get negative four. Negative four is in there, negative four is in an output. So it doesn't give me the entire code domain. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's domain, code domain, and on to. Now we need to talk about one to one. No, that's what I was debating doing before we went over this. And I saw it. A function is one to one. First off, it has to be a function, meaning every input goes to unique output, right? Yeah. And it's a one to one function if every output goes to a unique input. This right here is not a one to one function because this goes to three and this goes to three. If we switch that three to an eight, Now that is a one-to-one -one function. Back to the context of what you've seen before, you were told f of x equals x squared is not one-to-one. -one. Negative one goes to one, positive one goes to one, or negative two goes to four, positive two goes to four. This function is one-to-one. -one. Another way that you can think about it is, if you tell me the output I can tell you what the input was, right? If I said the output to this function was 4, what was the input? You don't know. If I say the output to this function was 8, what was the input? You know right off the bat, it was 2. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's another way to think about one-to-one -one functions. Another way to think about one-to-one -one functions is that their inverse is also a function. What do we mean by the inverse of a function? We mean swap everything. Right? So put this back to what it was. Here's three and three. Let's look at the inverse of that. So then f inverse is equal to the set two, one, three, two, three, three, seven, four. Now this is not a function. Because you have 3 goes to 2 and 3 goes to 3. So a function is 1 to 1 if its inverse is also a function. That's another way that you can think about it. So if we switch this up here back to an 8, then that switches this to an 8 when we take its inverse, right? We swap all the elements. And so now both of those are functions. So if a function, if the inverse of a function is also a function, then it's 1 to 1. What if it's inverse? What if it's not a function, but its inverse is a function like g? Then you just have a relation whose inverse is a function. There's no special name for it. That I'm aware of. Okay. So let's go over it again. What's a relation? A relation in the set of ordered pairs. Yeah. Set of ordered pairs. Right. What's a function? It's a relation. It's a relation where every unique, every uh, input has a unique output. Where every left-hand element is mapped to a unique right-hand element. Every unique left-hand element is mapped to a unique right-hand element. Okay? What is an onto function? It's when uh, every, every, uh, every bit of the code domain involves the method, the image. Right. So a function f from A to B is on to if its image is equal to B. It uses the entire code domain. It uses all these elements. This function right here is not on to. We move that arrow to go to there and this arrow to go to here. It's now on to. Not on to is on to. Doesn't give me all the real numbers as an output. Does give me all the real numbers as an output when we view f as a function from the rows to the rows. Okay? Uh, and then the last special type of function we talk about is called a bijection. A bijection is a function that's one to one and on two. Okay, I thought that isn't that bijection. This the cube. No, the cube. This. Yeah. This happens to be a bijection. Yeah. It's one to one, and it's on two. Because it goes for infinity. It's one to one, meaning if I give you an output, you can tell me what input that function had, or you can take its inverse and it's also a function, or, well, that's enough. So it's one to one, and then 
its input or its output is all the real numbers. I can get any real number as an output here. Give me an example of a function that's not one to one and it's a bijection function. The definition of bijection is one to one and on two. You mean not on two but one to one? Oh, no. One to one but not on two? Yeah. Oh, easy. So, feel like you got one to one, on to bijection? Yeah. Those are, that's common terminology that we're going to use with punctuation. Wait, what's bijection again? One to one and on to. Right. By, by, both. By, two. It has both of them. So you need to remember one to one and on to. And then bijection is both. It has those two properties. Okay? Uh, on to one to one bijection. Oh, we did not even get to the field out change today. Well, I wasted a good half hour this morning running around doing stuff. I didn't expect the motion to go so long. All right. Let's just jump into it and get through the field axioms, and then we might not be able to get through all my curves. Okay, so remember going back, we knew what the natural numbers are, we knew what the integers are, we knew what the rationals are. Now the question is, what are the real numbers? And we're going to start by, the real numbers is a set that satisfies all these things, but we're going to start listing out all the axioms of the real numbers. These are like postulates for Euclidean geometry. What is Euclidean geometry? It's geometry with these postulates. What are the real numbers? It's the real numbers with these axioms. Or it's the set with these axioms. Okay? Same we're thinking there. Okay. So these are the field axioms. Basically, any set that satisfies these axioms is a field. The rationals, you'll find out, are also a field. But we won't worry about that right now. So, let's see. For each pair of real numbers, x. The parentheses are part of it. Okay? So, one, here's what we're assuming with our numbers. We're not going to start here, we're going to assume. If you give me a set of numbers with a plus defined, so that x plus y is a number, and a multiplication defined, so that x times y is a number, then it needs to satisfy the properties I'm about to list that these two operations have to have. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So we don't know what those operations are. You do, but pretend you know. So we've got some, for any two pairs of numbers, we have a plus operation that we can apply. And for any two pairs of numbers, we have a product operation we can apply. And all we know is that when you take two numbers and add them together, it gives you a number. And when you take two numbers and you multiply together, it gives you a number. And that these operations satisfy these things. And these are called the field actions. So I'm going to list out all these so 
one for all x, y, and r. For every pair of numbers you take, x plus y is equal to y plus x. So the plus factor satisfies that. Okay. For any two real numbers, is another way you can say that. For all x, y real numbers in there, they can be the same, they can be different, doesn't matter. So for any two real numbers you pick, x plus y equals y plus x. We don't prove this, this is an assumption. This is our first axiom. Our second axiom. For all real numbers, x, y, z. So pick any three real numbers you want. Then x plus y plus z is equal to x plus y plus z. What does this mean? So it's understood that you do what's in the parentheses first, right? So if you take x plus y and add them together, then add z, you get the exact same thing if you take y and z, add them together, and then plus x. This is an assumption. We can't prove this. No, these are assumptions. You can't prove it. That is weird when you first think about it. The most basic properties, you can't prove. There are your assumptions. They make every line. It's like in geometry, you can't define a point. There's no definition of a point. There's no definition of a line. There's no definition of a point. It's an undefined term. And you use postulates to get those things meaning. And then all the postulates you also can't prove. They're assumptions. OK. Three. We assume that there exists some zero element in R. So we assume that this set R contains this zero element such that zero plus x is equal to x for all x in R. I didn't write that up there. But you understand what I'm saying? We're saying that this set R contains a zero element such that if I add anything to that zero element, I just get the element back. That's an assumption that we make about the real numbers. We don't prove that zero is in the real numbers. We're assuming that there's a zero in the real numbers, such that this is a property zero has. What does that even mean again? There exists. There, there exists, exists a zero, zero in R. And I should have written it like this. Let me just write that all the way instead of the sloppy sort of hand I did. No. There exists zero in R such that for all x in R, 0 plus x equals x. Okay? In other words, we assume that the real numbers contain the zero element, and 0 plus any real number is just that real number. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that make sense? These properties should seem kind of trivial to you. Yes, but my question is, what are, we, what are we trying to do? Are you, you're saying we're trying to find real numbers, so separate numbers? Right now, we talked about natural numbers, integers, and rationals, right? Mm -hmm. Now we erase your understanding of all those and pretend those don't exist. Because a common way to do it is to start with the rationals, use the rationals to build the integers, use the integers to build, sorry, start with the natural numbers, use the naturals to build the integers, use the integers to build the rationals, then use the rationals to build the reals. That's one way to do it. We're doing it completely different. We're saying we're going to start out with some set and two operations that satisfy some assumptions. Right. We're going to use a symbol for the set. Right. And then we are going to define the natural numbers as a special subset of that set. And we're going to define the integers as a special subset of that set. So and we're going to define the rationals as a special subset of that set. So right now we're finding real numbers. So right now we are defining what we mean by this symbol. Okay. When we write that symbol, Along with, we have this property paired with it, That's plus, nice <laughs> and this property paired with it, times. Mm -hmm. So if we got that set, these two operations, then we're talking about, when we're talking about this set, we're, we're assuming these things about the set. We're assuming picking two things out of that set, when you apply that operation we were talking about before, it's the same no matter what order you do it in. I don't see much difference between one and two. Well, like, I don't think, why is that necessary to add that set? Because it doesn't this, Whoa, these do not say the same thing. This says 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 3 plus 2. But as long as you add 2 and 3 and 3 and 2 at the same time, you're good. This one says something very different. This says it doesn't matter if you do 2 plus 3, then add the 4, or if you do 
you 3 plus 4, then add the 2. Does that make sense? Because there are other operations out there where this is not the case, and this is the case. But we won't be dealing with any of those operations in this class. I, have I can't think of any off the top of my head. Okay. So we assume, when we write that symbol, that there is a zero element in there, such that this is true when we use that plus operation. That R means real numbers, right? Yeah, we call that the set of real numbers. We're proving it. But right now, we are defining what we mean by that set of real numbers. The set of real numbers can go through all these operations. And you're saying that x, okay, so like take this top one, you're saying x and y can be any number. I'm saying whatever the set is that we're defining, we call them real numbers, pick any two elements out of there. Then we're assuming that this is true. There's another number. Okay, but my question is, if x is negative 1 and y is 1, then it's zero, but if y is one, okay, no, that's not acceptable. If x is negative two and y is one, then negative two plus, I Same am so thing. confused. It's the same thing. No, it's not. Well, this, for oh all the God. algebra you've been doing, is true. I have been so confused. Oh my gosh, okay, never mind. Okay, bye. All right, another property we assume. We assume that for all real numbers, comma, there exists another real number such that So is this just taking min's and negatives? Yeah, this this is gonna help us with our creation of the negative number. We assume that for every x you pick, there's a character embedded. Then there is some other number, such that when you put those two together, you get zero with this special operation. And we, we know, right? Pick any number you want, pick a random number. Four. Four, then negative four it would be the y. So for any x you pick, I can find a y such that x plus y is zero. That's one way that you can think about that sentence. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So no challenges to that one? So those are all our addition ones. Now we need to start with our multiplication ones. Number five. Very similar. Uh, we assume for all x and y and r, x times y is equal to y times x. We've got the part for that. We also have 6, the counterpart for 2. For all x, y, and z in r, x times y times z is equal to x times y times z. 7, counterpart for 3. We assume that there exists a one element in there. There exists a one in R, such that for all x in R, sorry, do it such that, such that for all x in R, uh, one times x is equal to x. And then 8 is a counterpart to 4. You can't even divide those. We're not talking about divide. Oh, and we're so you need to define what divide means. Y equals 1. Yeah. So for all x in R, there exists a y in R such that x times y equals 1. So pick any real number you want, okay. pick any x, 3, then I say 1 third. For any x you pick, 3, I can find a counterpart, 1 third, such that x times y equals 1. Once again, not a proof. We're assuming that the set of real numbers have this property. And then 9 and 10. 
9 is the distributive law, and then 10 is the non-trivial law. So 9, for all x, y, z, and r, we assume that x times y plus z is equal to x times y plus x times z. And then finally, 10, we assume that 1 is not equal to 0. Those are two different numbers. Really? What? OK. So let's make sure we understand this so far. So far, we're saying if you have the sum plus operation and sum multiply operation, we're saying the set of the real numbers is the set that satisfies all these things. This one we call, what property is this? Commutative. Commutative property. They uh, reduce it to order, doesn't matter. This one we call the associative property. You can associate those two together, or you can associate those two together. This zero we call the additive identity. Okay? And then this y we call the additive inverse. y is the additive inverse of x. If x plus y equals 0, y is the additive inverse of x, and x is the additive inverse of y. OK? Addition is commutative. Addition is associative. There exists an additive identity element. There exists an additive inverse element. For each real number. Okay? Repeat. Multiplication is commutative. Multiplication is associative. There exists a multiplicative identity element. For each element, there exists a multiplicative inverse. This tells us how to combine the two operations. Yeah. This puts multiplication and addition together in one. So if you are using both those operations together, this tells you how to do it. And then finally, our multiplicative and our associative identities are not the same. Or our multiplicative and our additive identities are not the same. They thought that was trivial. That's non-trivial. Yeah, it's the non-trivial assumption. Not the trivial assumption. It's pretty trivial. <laughs> All right, so before we continue with more properties of the real numbers, Let's just start proving some things that we know about the real numbers just from these properties. So the first thing that we have proved is that there isn't more than one zero element. I'm going to prove that there's only one zero in all the real numbers. Can you also prove there's only one one? Yeah. That's going to be your method proof that you have to do. That's true. <laughs> so I'm going to prove Let's see how I say it. There is only one zero element. In other words, if I find some other element where this is true, then that element I found is zero. Right? Okay. So I'm going to introduce you to a way of proving that you may or may not have come across before. It's called proof by contradiction. The way that we can prove a statement is true is we show it's impossible for it to be false. If it can't be false, it's true. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So here's what I would do. I start with some statement A, and I want to show that statement A is true. How do I do that? I take not A, I think it's contradiction, and I show that that is false. That is impossible. That can't be true. And if not A can't be true, if not A is false, then A is therefore true. true. So I'm going to take this statement, A, I'm going to show that not A is false, and so A has to be true. Okay? Mm -hmm. And maybe when I write this out, you'll see what I'm talking about better, but this is a good, simple proof to show a proof by contradiction. And the way that we start a proof by contradiction is we start with 
assume by way of contradiction, instead of having to spell it all out, you're telling your reader very clearly, hey, I'm about to assume not the statement that we're trying to prove. So be careful. Because you might think that I went and proved something that I wasn't trying to prove. Okay. And it's very common that you're going to get lost in the proof and say, why are you trying to prove that when this is the statement? It's because we're trying to prove not this statement. So now let's look at the not of this statement. So assume by way of contradiction that there exists some zero prime element, I'll put a prime there, such that, why prime? Because we're, if we're saying some other one. Here, let me finish writing the whole statement and I think you'll see it. Oh yeah, right. So I'm saying, as, by way of contradiction, assume that there exists some other zero element, so that any time you take that zero element and add it to x, you just get x, yeah. just like right here. And so there is some other element that satisfies this property, we're calling it zero prime, and that element is different than zero. How do you show it's different? I'm assuming it's different. Now my goal is to show that this statement is false. Right. This statement is the opposite of this statement. If this statement's true, its opposite is false. Right. If this statement is false, its opposite is true. I'm going to show that this is false, therefore this is true. You see the logic there? Yeah. Okay, so let's show that this is impossible. So next step. Two. Let x equal 0, then 0 prime plus 0 is equal to 0. I'm plugging in 0 for this equation. We know that 0 prime satisfies this property, right? Yeah. 3. Observe that 0 prime plus 0 using the commutative property is equal to 0 plus 0 prime. If I were writing out my proof explicitly, I'd say using the commutative property. When I write proofs on the whiteboard, I'm just going to say out loud what I would have written for the sake of saving time in class. That's going to be a common habit. Okay? okay? And that's through the commutative property. Did I never plug that in? Oh, forget it. <laughs> I thought I forgot to plug in my chart. Okay, so we know that this is equal to this, right? All right, now I use our definition of zero right here. Zero plus anything is that right hand thing. So zero prime, like, so zero prime plus. Zero plus anything is just that right hand thing. Zero plus x equals x. That's our definition of how zero works right here. Yeah. Okay. Right? So zero prime plus zero is equal to zero plus zero prime. Right? Yeah. Plus zero plus zero prime is zero prime. But I just barely showed that this number equals zero and that this number equals zero prime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right here, I showed that zero prime plus zero is zero, right? Yeah. Right here, I showed that zero prime plus zero is the same thing as zero plus zero prime, is zero prime. So I showed this equals zero and I showed this equals zero prime. So I showed zero equals zero prime. But you proved it right. <laughs> I feel like you just proved Contradiction. it. Contradiction. That's impossible. It can't be the case. Let's walk through the logic one more time. I said, assume by way of contradiction that there is some zero prime element that satisfies this property, and zero prime is not equal to zero. It's different than zero. Oh, it equals zero right there. Oh, yeah, right. here we said zero equals zero prime. Okay. So we showed if some other element satisfies this property, uh, that thing's actually zero. Okay. Right? Okay. So make sure you understand the logic of it one more time. What does this statement say? This statement says that there is only one element, zero, 
that satisfies this property. We want to take the opposite of that. What's the opposite if there's only one element that satisfies this property? There isn't only one element that satisfies that property. Right? So, you can look at that as there's zero or there's two. Well, we know zero is false because we're guaranteed that there's one. So then there's two or more elements that satisfy that property. That's what the opposite of the statement means, right? There is only one zero element. The opposite of that is there is more than one zero element. We said, let's call one of them zero prime. And we're saying that that thing is not the same thing as zero, but it satisfies the same property. Right. Well, if it satisfies the same property, it turns out it is zero. Right. Okay? So we show that this is impossible. You can't have an element that satisfies the property that zero satisfies that isn't zero. This is impossible. So if this is impossible, then this statement is always false, right? Yeah. There exists zero prime such that zero prime plus x equals x and zero prime does not equal zero. is always false. So its contradiction is always true. Okay. Its opposite is always true. The statement's not false, it's true. So if its contradiction is false, then the statement is true. If the statement's contradiction if the statement is false, then its contradiction is true. No, if the statement's contradiction is false, the statement is true. That's, that's another way to say it. That's what you just did there. I, I, we said the logically equivalent things. So yes, what you said is fine. Okay? So five, you might write, therefore, no zero prime element exists. And we're done with our proof. And you put a box at the end of your proofs, that box is a replacement for some letters which represented a Latin phrase which represent which meant, and thus it is demonstrated. <laughs> this is a blank job. So you put the little box at the end when you're done with your proofs. Does this proof make sense? Mm -hmm. They're a little bit weird to deal with these types of proofs when you first get into them. And the only way to get comfortable with proofs, I'm telling you right now. Do a bunch. There's no shortcut. There's no easy way. There's no guaranteed formula that if you go through every time, you're going to get a good proof. It just doesn't happen. Let's do another proof. Let's prove that Let's prove that for all x in R, for every real number, then x times 0 is equal to 0 times x is equal to 0. Do you understand what we're trying to show? I'm trying to show that this is equal to this is equal to this for any real number you picked. I need to show that those three things hold. Okay? So one, observe that zero is equal to zero plus zero. Any problem there? No. Okay. Then we'll find both sides by a. A times zero is equal to a times zero plus zero. Any problems there? I probably should have said then that comma for any a in R. Specify where my a comes from. Oh, we're using x's, not a's. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, you don't need to say that. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. We already know what x is. From our statement. You, gotta read you, know. <laughs> you sure? Alright. So then we have that, right? And I'm going to keep writing out this. Distributive property now. This is x times 0 plus x times 0. Right? Which is equal to 
x times 0 plus 0 times x using the community property on that. You good with all the leaps I'm making here? Mm -hmm. Kind of covering a lot in one statement.
So it's assumed that if a, it's assumed that a plus b equals a plus b. Okay. So if I know that b equals c, I can substitute in a plus b equals a plus c. Oh, that's not the logic that we're looking for. If I have two sides of the equation, a equal to a, and I add the same thing to both sides, I have a plus b equals a plus b. So you have the same number, and we're saying that the same number adds the same number is the same number. Right? Right? Because you can substitute. We're assuming that when you have the same symbols on both sides of the equation, they're equal. And since they're equal, we know we can substitute for the same side. We can substitute, right? So if I have a equals c, then I know that a plus b equals c plus b. How do I know that? Because I can substitute that c for a by definition of those being equal. So that's how you know that you can add to both sides, and that's also how you know you can times the same thing to both sides. Same argument. a times b is the same number as a times b. Does that make sense? Okay. So you can add the same thing to both sides. So where, I don't see where you did it. Right here. So we have this equation. We defined what y is, and then we took this equation and added y to both sides. I took that plus y, I took that, which is in parentheses, plus y. Okay. Then I reordered the right hand side. Yeah, I, saw that. I swapped the y with this thing. Okay. Right? So now, on the left hand side, I have x0 plus y, which we know is 0. And on the right hand side, I have an x0 plus y, which we know is 0. So that goes to that 0. That goes to that 0, and then that 0x is that 0x is that 0. Did I lose you all that? Yeah, you got, got 0 equals 0 times x. Yeah, so now you got 0 equals 0 times x, and then finally using what? Commutative property. That's also equal to x times 0. And we're done. So we proved what? <laughs> we proved that x times 0 equals 0 times x equals 0. We already had that one for free because of the commutative property. property, but we need to show that they were actually equal to 0 as well. So once we had that they, one of them was equal to 0, we get the other one for free. So we just proved that a number times 0 equals 0. Yeah, that's what we just proved. We said whatever that additive identity element is, it turns out when you multiply by it, you get 0. Yeah, very interesting. Because if you think you, about it, the, it makes no sense. The way to make this these early proofs make sense is to try and forget that you know so much about real numbers. Right. You almost have to try and forget that and just use what you're told you can use. Why were we ever out. told that seven teddy bears times zero teddy bears is zero teddy bears? <laughs> We were, we were just told anything by 10 to 0. Alright, I'm saying that. that doesn't so, really we're way out of time, geez. And we didn't get through everything I wanted to, so.